Okay, well, thanks for being here uh, today on this uh, incredibly warm November uh, morning. Uh, there's a lot to learn about uh, bed bugs, and I have to say that whenever I was studying as an entomologist, I never imagined that I would be uh, working on, on bed bugs. Uh, termites are actually my uh, real love what I, I work on. <laughs> but uh, bed bugs have become something that is literally an epidemic. And Ohio has been very, very impacted by uh, bed bugs. So there's a great need for education about these uh, bugs. Um, these are true insects. They have six legs, they have a pair of antennae, but they have piercing, sucking mouth parts. And the only thing that they feed on is blood. They do not require a food source other than uh, blood. They don't require water. So they're very unlike uh, many other insects. Um, they are external parasites. They stay very briefly on the body to take that blood meal. And they prefer to feed on humans. If humans aren't available, however, they will feed on other warm-blooded animals. So on things like your pets, your cats, your dogs, or rodents, bats, they look for areas that don't have a lot of hair because they, wanna, uh, they don't like having their mouth parts go through a lot of hair. So on these alternate hosts, uh, they feed on the more naked spots, such as the underbelly and, and such. Um, and they cause severe economic, physical, emotional distress. Uh, they are considered to be a pest of significant public health importance. Now, um, they can happen to anyone. Uh, literally, if you are a living, breathing human being, you can get bed bugs. They aren't caused by poor housekeeping, but if you have a lot of clutter, you will keep bed bugs because it offers them a lot of hiding places. Now, in the 1940s and the 1950s, we got rid of bed bugs for the uh, largest extent in the United States and other developed countries. But these bugs continued to be a problem in underdeveloped regions around the world. And where we were using DDT, bed bugs developed resistance in the mid 40s, early 50s. So bringing back a product like DDT would not work because the bed bugs are resistant to it. And in fact, uh, that is one of the reasons why some of our current products aren't as effective, is because they have a similar mechanism as the uh, DDT in, in terms of the mode of action. And with this cross resistance, we see products not working as well as what we would like. Now, there's been a worldwide resurgence of bed bugs since the late 1990s. And Ohio has been very, very high on the list of the most bed bug infested states. Uh, year after year, when Orkin and Terminex come out with their rankings, um, we have cities such as uh, Columbus and Cincinnati, Cleveland, Dayton, all making the top 10. And, and being a Buckeye, I, I know what it's like. We want to be on the top 10, but we definitely don't want to be on this top 10. Um, now, these are some of the places in Ohio that I have uh, had calls about bed bugs. This slide is from a number of years ago. So uh, probably right now, I could circle every single entity in Ohio, and I would say, oh, we are now a red state looking at all of these red circles. But um, bed bugs impact our large cities, they impact small towns, small uh, communities. And one of the reasons that they do is because of human behavior. There's a big human factor associated with bed bugs, and we have to overcome this stigma. I mean, anybody can get bed bugs. Uh, you go back historically, and uh, there was some stigma associated with bed bugs, and it still carries on today. You aren't ashamed when you're bit by a mosquito. Well, 
A bed bug is like a mosquito in terms of trying to feed on, on your blood. Um, we need to overcome these uh, stigmas. Uh, we need to be able to correctly identify a bed bug, and I'll show you some of the things uh, that uh, you can use to help with identification. And there's general ignorance of uh, management strategies. Other things like having a lack of, of money, uh, clutter, mental health problems, physical incapacity, being unable to do all the prep that some companies uh, require for uh, treatment. But I want to introduce you to the concept of integrated pest management, or IPM. And what this is, is the idea that you're going to use multiple tactics for dealing with a pest. Um, this pertains to any type of insect, but it really pertains to bed bugs. So um, there are a lot of different treatment options. Uh, you can go the insecticide route, you can go the heat route, uh, you can use steam, you can use uh, sanitation measures, and today you're going to hear about some of these different treatment options. These are some of the newer insecticides that are out on the market, and uh, I say they're pyrethroid alternatives. Pyrethroids are the class of uh, chemistry that bed bugs have developed resistance to, to at least some of the pyrethroids. And so now you have combination products that have a different chemical class plus your uh, pyrethroid, and these are some of the product names. Now, just because these names are on the list and they're registered by EPA doesn't mean they're equally effective. And I'll, um, today, Jeff White is going to really concentrate on management and uh, probably will tell you about some of these chemicals. I will uh, mention a few in my presentations as well. But the very the basics are there's no magic bullet. If you read on the internet that somebody has found a magic bullet, you just click through to another site. There is no magic bullet. On average, when you're using insecticides, it takes three insecticide applications to get rid of bed bugs. So you do one treatment, you wait a week or two, you read the label, you, say, you see it says, okay, you cannot reapply for at least 10 days, then 10 days later, or you come in with a second insecticide and you rotate insecticides. Now, uh, there is an option of using whole room uh, heat treatments. Uh, it is typically a six to eight hour process. If a company sells you a heat treatment and they're out of there in three to four hours, you have just been ripped off, okay? Um, it is a six to eight hour process. The temperature has to get to 135 degrees. They're using temperature probes to make sure that you have reached the temperature deep inside items, inside walls. They have fans to blow the heat. They're going in there turning items. And I can tell you the temperature gets to be around 100 and the bugs are just going crazy, moving everywhere. Uh, um, but it offers no residual protection. So when the heat is gone, there's nothing there to protect you should you get new bed bugs. So that's why my idea is that you need to do heat plus insecticide. Have, and these insecticides will hold up to the heat temperatures. All the manufacturers have done research and they show that the, the chemical doesn't break down at these uh, temperatures. So it's a good idea to have the two combined. Now, the bed bug factor is something that is just amazing. Um, if you look at the life cycle of the bug, which is shown uh, diagram in this diagram, um, you have male and female bugs. Um, they mate, the female lays eggs, and then you go through five different immature stages. A bug is stuck in that nymphal stage unless it feeds. So the only way it has enough energy to uh, shed its skin and grow is to feed. And this shows you what it looks like when it's unfed on the top, on the bottom when it's fed at each of these five stages. 
Once it reaches the fifth stage, it is now molting and becoming the adult stage. And as an adult, it's no longer going to molt, but they're going to feed on average about every seven days. So it's not like you and me who need to, to eat three times a day, at least I do. And, uh, but with this bug, they're going to eat about once a week. Um, that's why whenever you get a beginning infestation and you just have a few bugs, you may not be bitten every day. It's because of the feeding behavior of these uh, bugs. Now, oh, let me also say that this life cycle is very dependent on temperature. So if you're in a home that is kept extremely warm, 86 degrees, they are going to go through from egg to adult in just three weeks time. I go into homes, uh, particularly for elderly people, and they're very, very hot. I feel like I, I need to be wearing a bathing suit or something because I'm sweating. And the bugs are, they're just a massive population. And that's because that life cycle is, goes so quickly. So you can have many, many generations in a year. Even when you keep your temperatures 65 or so, it's gonna take three months. These bugs do not live outside. They live inside and they're closely associated with uh, humans. They hide from floor to ceiling. They, I'll show you how they uh, disperse um, and I'll show you some of the variable reactions people have when they're bitten by these uh, bugs. Now, uh, back to IPM, I showed you the treatment options. Now, you know, the basics are first, make sure you have bed bugs. Correctly identify the pest, do a thorough inspection, and that means you have to know where they're hiding, use sanitation measures, use non-chemical measures, and apply insecticides to targeted sites. So these are all pluses. You know, these are things that you add on in order to have this complete strategy for controlling the bed bugs. So how to recognize if it's a bed bug? Well, they have this very oval-shaped body. It's very flat when they're unfed, but after they feed, they swell up like a little balloon. Uh, they don't stay in that balloon-like shape for very long. They quickly digest their blood meal. And so most of the time when you see them, you're gonna see them relatively flat. They're about a quarter to three-eighths an inch as an adult. That's the size of an apple seed for some types of apples. Now, the youngest nymphs, those ones that just hatch out of the egg, they're going to be tiny. Uh, uh, but you can still see them. Uh, they would look like a little sesame seed. So in terms of the color, oh, up here on the far left, this is one that uh, has not fed. Here are ones that have recently, that have, have, uh, have fed fairly long ago, but you can see that black dot shows that there's still remnants of the blood meal inside their gut. You're looking through the insect and seeing the, uh, the gut and the uh, remnants of the previous blood meal. When they uh, just detach after feeding, they're this crimson red for the early stage, for others that are, they're more reddish uh, brown. So uh, how many of you know how to tell the difference between a adult male and an adult female uh, bed bug? Okay, some, some of you do. Okay, whenever somebody brings me a bed bug from a school, one of the first things I do is I look at it and I say, ah, it's an immature bed bug. Immatures can't breed. Or I say it's a male bed bug or it's a female bed bug. And here's what I'm looking at. The female is on the left, the male is on the right, and I'm looking at the curvature of the abdomen, the very tip of it, very rounded in the female, more pointed in the, um, in the male. Uh, if you turn them upside down, you see the same uh, characteristics. You see that rounded appearance versus more pointed. And then if you have a microscope, there's a little indentation on the female, and this is where mating uh, takes place. It's called traumatic insemination, and, and you can look it up. So you can, but let's just say it's not a pleasant experience for these uh, female bugs. Um, we, at OSU, we have an identification uh, service. It is a 4B 
uh, service, $20 uh, per sample. We, they identify virtually any type of insect, not just uh, bed bugs. So phone number and uh, um, a website for them. Um, in terms of the habits of bed bugs, they don't fly, but they crawl, they run, and they move very, very quickly. And they like to hide during the day. They're most active at nighttime. Um, and whenever you find them on a surface and you try to remove them, oftentimes they're clinging very, very tightly to that surface, so it can be difficult to uh, remove them. But they travel, they travel on their own, they, they walk on their own, and they are also moved by people. If you're in a apartment complex and there's an infested room, for those of you who are apartment managers, don't just concentrate on this room. Make sure you're checking all of the adjacent uh, properties because here's what's going to happen. The bed bugs are going to start breeding and they're going to start moving. And depending on the type of construction, they are going to be able to infest the adjacent rooms. So uh, they will move. Um, furthermore, they're going to hitchhike. They're going to climb into belongings and travel with you. And here's some examples of bed bugs traveling with people. Um, this is a, a walker, and you can see right here, it's a metal surface, but this bug is clinging to that metal surface. It's going round and around and around, and at some point, it's going to let go. Boom, now it's in a new environment. It has just become a hitchhike to a new location. Uh, this poor individual is in a wheelchair that is literally infested with bed bugs. And, and all of this white here is the remnants of eggshells and shed skins. Uh, every time the bugs want to feed, they just come out, find a, 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 a bare area on the person, feed, and then they tuck back in the wheelchair. So you can see how easily these bugs uh, move and, you know, individuals require uh, uh, wheelchairs, walkers and such, uh, and these people are at the mercy of the bed bugs. Um, this is from an OSU dorm room. Uh, this student had suitcase underneath the bed. And here are a group of eggs that are attached to the suitcase. Here are others hiding. We're trying to pick some out of this tiny crack and uh, crevice. This student had recently traveled to a large airport with that suitcase. Do you think maybe he brought some bed bugs with him? Only thing that was good about this situation was they checked everything in the entire dorm to see who else had bed bugs. And his girlfriend had bed bugs and his other girlfriend had bed bugs. <laughs> so the bed bugs ratted him out. <laughs> Um, th these are my technician's shoes after we visited a property in Dayton. A, a, it was an elderly woman. She said, nobody's coming in treating my property. I do not have bed bugs. She was very ashamed. We walked out. How many bed bugs do you think had tucked away in his shoes? Thirteen. <laughs> and um, this one right here is recently fed, and it's a female. They mate almost as soon as they feed. So she is able to lay a lot of eggs. He could have started a brand new infestation. This was my uh, master's student after we went to a pro another property, a single family home in Dayton. And uh, she had bed bugs on her shoes as well. She had seven of them. Um, for those of you who work in infested properties, your shoes are what you really have to check. Uh, um, and I'll show, tell you a little bit of, of the measures that we use uh, whenever we are in properties a, a bit later on. But these bugs can survive starvation for long, long periods of time. This paper from Virginia Tech shows that those little first stage ones will survive without feeding for uh, about two weeks to over a month. And those fifth stage, the ones that are getting ready to become adults, they're going to survive short in, you know, over a month 
to several months. Um, this was a study that we did uh, in an infested home where we were testing the neem seed oil uh, product uh, circle. Uh, ended up that uh, we had to apply almost 16 gallons of the product in order to get the bed bugs down to uh, zero. Um, we definitely knocked down the population, but look, we were collecting nymphal bed bugs for 110 days. There was nobody left in that home. The elderly resident had moved out, had no rodents. I asked him to keep the temperature about 68, 70, uh, which is normal temperatures. And so uh, we were still collecting nymphs for, at the end of 110 days and a live adult for about 145 days. So these bugs can survive uh, starvation. And then you have lower temperatures, they're gonna even be able to survive longer. So extremely hardy insects. And as I said, they hide from floor to ceiling. Um, that picture is with a Columbus apartment right above the bed. And we moved it and you can see that it has a breeding population. Uh, this one is from Cincinnati in the underside of furniture. Uh, this was a different apartment in Columbus and it, he had such a heavy infestation that the bugs had buried themselves in the carpet. Uh, to, they like a lot of, of body contact. They have little hairs all over them. And when those hairs are pressed down, it feels very comfortable uh, to them. And so they were using the carpeting as a uh, hiding site. This is from a dorm room and they're in the electrical outlets. And they literally hide everywhere. They're called bed bugs. Um, because one of the first places you find them is your box spring, not your mattress. They have many hiding places in the box spring and then they move to the mattress. They'll be in the bed frame. They will be in other furniture. They will be under the carpet tack strip. They will be in drapery pleats, smoke detectors, behind baseboards. So from floor to uh, ceiling are places that they can hide. Um, this is from uh, a, a place in Dayton, a, uh, a, uh, and this individual was sleeping in this bed and massive bed bug infestation. I think we, we took this about a, less than a year ago. Um, this actually is a sofa bed, and you would think that was maybe the texture of the sofa, but you look up at high magnification, it's bed bug eggs. This, there was such a heavy infestation and these individuals had mental health uh, issues and uh, you know we tried to help them. Well we were collecting the bugs so that we could rear them in the lab because I'm doing studies on insecticides and, and such. But it was, it was really heartbreaking because when we left uh, the, the gentleman said to us you're the first individuals who have treated us like human beings. And it just broke my heart. I, I was well, like, um, you know, you should, they couldn't get a loan to clean up their place. Uh, it, it was literally devastating for them. And, um, and so trying to help them and help us at the same time, um, going out to these places is really an eye opener. Uh, my master's students, told me, she said, she, this was her first place that she had visited with me, and she said, you know, you, you talk about how this is a life-changing experience, and I heard that, but I didn't realize it until I actually came out. And she said, now I understand, and my life is, is changed. You really want to help people who have these massive in, infestations. And in this country, it's really, a shame how little resources are spent on people who have uh, bed bug infestations. In terms of their uh, feeding habits, they're called bed bugs because they're often associated where you sleep or where you rest, at least initially. Um, and they locate you by the carbon dioxide that you breathe out, they like your body temperature, and they like the way humans smell. So all of these cues are things they use to hone in on a host, and they typically are going to feed at nighttime. These are some of the health effects. Um, seven out of 10 people have some type of allergic reaction to the injected saliva. 
three out of 10 people never even know that they've been bit. Um, you have things like anemia, where bed bugs have fed so much on people that, and there's so much blood loss that they become anemic. Um, psychological effects, agitation, anxiety, and the list goes on. And the Centers for Disease Control and the Environmental Protection Agency consider to bed bugs to be a pest of significant public health importance. Um, in terms of the manifestations of the bites, they're often on in groups or rows. They are typically on exposed skin. And uh, the reactions vary all the way from little tiny dots to uh, blood-filled blisters. And this paper came out talking about blood-filled blisters. It happens that this guy is a bed bug researcher and has a severe reaction to the bites. You can see here where the bug probed. So they were trying to locate a blood vessel. They couldn't until they got to this point. So there's a little tiny reaction right here and a major reaction here. And then over time, it becomes a weepy bite and he's left with a scar. And the implications were that he could have these scars both externally and internally. Um, th and this is something that the health community pretty much has uh, ignored. Uh, this is a friend of mine's sister, and she had bed bug bites uh, early on. Uh, and they didn't know what was happening uh, to her. Look at her arms, look at her leg. Her whole body is covered in scars from bed bug bites. Uh, um, and so when people say, oh, bed bugs are just a nuisance, it, it really gets me riled up because I, I know better. Um, there are a few data to support them as vectors of disease agents, but more and more research is being done on the possibility that they have the potential to transmit disease. In the talk today, I didn't have time to bring up those slides, but I can discuss that uh, with people if they'd like. Um, when it, no, how many of you have checked your room when you travel for bed bugs? Okay. How many of you are going to check your room? <laughs> I hope it's everybody. Um, you just make it standard practice. You want to make sure that you are looking for black fecal spotting, particularly on that bed skirt that doesn't get laundered. Um, and uh, you know, look for signs on the underside of the chest or drawers and, and such. Um, and don't stay in a room that has any signs of, of bed bugs. Change your behavior in the room. Don't use the provided chest or drawers because you could have missed some of the uh, bugs. That's a good hiding uh, place. Um, keep them in your suitcase, put it on the, the uh, luggage rack, but first check the luggage rack, turn it over, make sure there are no signs of, of bed bugs. If I'm really uh, concerned ab about them in a room, I will take the luggage rack and I'll put it in the bathtub with my suitcase because bugs can't navigate that porcelain surface, it's too slick. Um, but if you're gonna keep it in the room, pull it away from the walls because they will climb up the uh, walls. Um, I like going to a garage sales, thrift stores and, and such, but my days of buying upholstered furniture are over. And uh, clothing and such, I can launder and using your dryer is a very, very effective way to disinfect items. You just keep it in for 30 minutes on high heat without overpacking the dryer. And once the items are dry, you just let them dry for that 30 minutes. That's gonna kill all of the uh, stages. Uh, how many of you make home visits uh, uh, as part of your job? Okay, this is for you because I, I go into homes and I actually am looking for the ones that are the most infested because then I can collect lots of bed bugs to bring back to the, the uh, lab. I wear a fanny pack so that I don't have to have a suitcase. I carry a tote and I have my camera and notes and books and such in that so that it's always protected. And then um, as soon as I leave, I take off the, my shoes, I check them. I uh, have, if 
somebody with me, check my back, brush down, change my clothes when I get to work because I used to change them when I got home. And then I'm like, this is part of my job. If I bring bed bugs home, I'm gonna be responsible for uh, paying for this. So I just uh, change at uh, work, I bag things up. And then when I get home, I uh, launder them. Um, and uh, I have, have never brought bed bugs home with me. And I can tell you, I've been in places where they literally were falling on me. They were so bad. So um, taking some of these measures, another thing I do is, is I look like a dork, but I take my socks and I tuck them inside, uh, my, my pants leg and I tuck them inside my socks and I tuck my shirt in. So anything that climbs on me has to climb all the way up to my neck or to my um, arms to feed. So uh, I, I say, you know, looking like a dork is a small price to pay versus bringing uh, bed bugs home uh, with me. You can get these uh, Tyvek coveralls. Now I'm telling you, they are stinking hot. You are in, in those for a while and you are sweating like crazy. And after a while, you, you get a comfort level to some extent of saying, you know, the bugs are active at nighttime. They're typically not crawling out during the, the daytime and that's when I'm, I'm there. If the infestation is so bad that the bugs are out in the open, then chances are um, you wouldn't want to go into that home. But with, a, with smaller populations, they're hiding. So don't sit on upholstered sofas. Um, in Columbus, some of the public uh, health agencies bring their own chair with them, and it's one that they can easily wipe down. It's collapsible. They can keep it in their uh, uh, car. And so there are ways to prevent uh, bringing bed bugs home uh, with you. Um, I'm going to talk about integrated pest management again because it's so important that you have the basis of correct identification, doing your inspection to find all those hiding places. And uh, this is what I was saying about using the washer and dryer. You're looking at a temperature of 120 or higher, and that's usually medium to high heat. And the time that you need to keep them in is, is 30 minutes once they have become dry. So it would behoove you to use your washer and dryer rather than spend money on over-the-counter products that really don't work very well against uh, bed bugs. When we are out collecting bed bugs, we're using a vacuum. And let me show you what we do so as to protect our vacuum. We take the wand and we actually take a nylon stocking and we use it as an insert. Now, whenever we pick up the bugs, they all go into this little nylon stocking. Now, the minute you turn that, that vacuum off, you are quickly moving to tie off that stocking because the bugs are still alive. They're trying to crawl out. And then you can just take your bag of bugs. You can put it in a, a plastic bag, seal it up, and take it outside and dispose of it. If you're us, we take it back to the lab, and then we let the bugs out in, in containers in the lab. But this is a technique that we had developed back in 2001 for multicolored Asian lady beetles because um, they were such a problem back in, the, in 2000, 2001, and now we're using it for capturing um, bed bugs. Um, there are these interceptors that you can put underneath the bed legs. And so you can disinfect a uh, bed frame, a crib, and then have these interceptors. Now, you get a lot of information from the interceptors looking at the location where the bugs were found. If they're in this outer ring, it means that they came from somewhere off of the bed. If they are in this inner ring, it means they climbed down the bed leg and were captured in that inner ring. So the location of the bug in that device gives you information. It tells you, oh, there's still some bugs in the environment that we need to deal with, or I didn't get every last bug that was on the bed itself. But uh, um, the, the interceptors, they have a, a lot of different uh, types of them uh, now that are, are, are out there. You can encase your mattress in your box spring. Um, if you have very limited money, and you can't afford to encase both of them, you encase the box spring. 
many more hiding places than with the uh, mattress itself. But make sure it doesn't rip and make sure that that zipper is closed all the way. If it comes open, the bugs will just get in and have a nice hiding place. If it rips, they'll just get in and have a nice hiding place. Um, we've been doing research on a product that is not a, a bed liner. It fits like a, a fitted sheet. It's called Active Guard, and it's actually been impregnated with, a, uh, with permethrin and, and insecticide. And you, you re replace these about every two years. Uh, we've done research that shows that the bugs will actually, they won't avoid these, so they will stay on them and pick up a, a toxic dose. There is a, t a lag time to how fast they're killed. The more resistant populations, it'll take a longer time. But the most recent paper we published showed that their feed feeding behavior is quickly affected. With 10 minutes of contact with the permethrin impregnated fa the fabric, they stop probing, they stop feeding, and we had only one female bug that was able to lay eggs because if the female doesn't feed, she doesn't lay eggs. So we're continuing to do research on um, Active Guard. Um, you really need a professional pest management company to do uh, bed bug work and make sure they're licensed. Uh, High Department of Ag Pesticide Regulation Section uh, they are the entity that issues licenses. You can go to their website and you can see, make sure that the company you're planning to hire is licensed. Uh, you want to make sure you get three estimates. You want to uh, ask them questions based on what you've learned and seen here today. And, uh, you know, make sure that they're doing some of the things that we uh, uh, mentioned. If you have a company that's going to sell you a single insecticide treatment, uh, my recommendation is show them to the door because that is not enough. They at least have to come back and make sure they, that uh, all of the bugs are, are gone. So this has been a, a really brief introduction to uh, bed bugs, and Jeff White is going to talk a lot more about uh, management, and um, I've saved some, a little bit of time here for uh, questions, uh, um, if people have uh, questions they would like me to try to answer.